Are we ready for some word today? Yep. Yeah. Uh, how many of you have your spoon? What? Amen. Yeah. Well, we're supposed to consume the word, right? Oh. So how many have your spoon, your fork, your knife? Chopsticks. Um, <laughs> chopsticks if you're from certain ethnic groups. I don't use chopsticks because if I did, I would be skinnier. Oh, wait. There might be a connection to that. Exactly. <laughs> there might be a connection to that. If I use stop chopsticks, I couldn't get as many calories in. If you one little thing of rice at a time. So, all right. What we're going to do today is we're going to um, we're going to look at faith today. Can we do that? Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't feel the most prepared today, but we'll go from there. Um, I'll, I'll let I'll, I'll throw that disclaimer. I'm not feeling the most prepared, but we'll go ahead and go, and we'll see what happens. Uh, but I want to. I want to land today on this verse that I'm going to read right now. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. It says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's an amazing verse. And so what I want to do today is I want to talk about endurance. Um, because if there's one thing that I, I, I believe, especially in the American church, but I think it's overall, is that one thing we lack in America is endurance. Yeah. Yeah. Is it okay to say that? It's true. Yeah. I think we lack endurance. I think we allow the things that come into our life to dictate whether we press on, press through, and endure, or we give up. Come on. God is calling you and I to be pioneers, people that move forward. We're not called to stop. We're not called to stutter step. We're not called to go back. We're called to press on in Christ Jesus. Okay? And so, um, let, let's just pray right now. Father, we just lift, lift up your word. We thank you for your word. And Father, we just ask that you would use me today to convey what I believe is in my heart in a way that we can understand. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So what I just want to simply do today is I just want to go from this, this verse, these two verses, I just want to go through it, not pick it in depth apart, but just pick it apart a little bit. And so it says this, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And so what the writer of Hebrews is doing right now is he's drawing his attention back to chapter 11, okay? He's drawing his attention back to chapter 11, and I just want to go over just some of this stuff real quick. Because he, he laid down, you know, we've gone through the faith of Abel, we've gone through the faith of Enoch, we've gone through the faith of Noah, uh, of Abraham, and stuff like that. Those are the people who are the, the founders of faith, right, in, in, in the Bible. And so we want to just, just look real quick, if, and, and, and if you haven't done it, read chapter 11, all of it. Because what it should do is it should stir your faith up a little bit. Okay? Because and here's why. They didn't have the knowledge of the word of God and God like we have today. <coughs> if anybody's faith in the history of the world should be stronger, it should be the church today. Amen. Because we have more revelation and more understanding of who God is. They didn't. And yet they're heroes of faith. And so we, we go through this and, and, and it picks up again here in, in verse 13, talking about them all dying in faith. They hadn't received the promises, but they still died in faith. They still died believing the things that God promised. Abraham never saw the, the Israel becoming a nation of, of the numbers of the stars of the sea. He never saw it, but he believed it. And he died believing that. And it just goes on and it starts talking about Abraham again. And it, and it talks about Isaac and, and Jacob and Joseph and the faith that they had as, as they walked out their relationship with the Lord. And then it goes in and talks quite a bit about Moses. You know, what's interesting about Moses is his faith was such a faith that he denied the riches of Egypt to be afflicted with the people of God. Come on. He denied the riches of the world to be a child of the living God. There's where we can lose some people in America, church, today. Is not willing to die to the things of the world and become a child of God. Many in the church... Today, even pursue riches of the world at the expense of a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
And so we, we see that, and, and it goes on through there, and then it starts just talking about some other scenarios, like the walls of Jericho falling down after it was marched through in seven days, and the faith of Ahab, uh, not Ahab, Rahab, um, as she uh, believed the spies. And, and so God spared her. When everything crashed down and everybody else died, she lived. Ironically, Ahab becomes a genealogy of Jesus. Okay? Rahab. Rahab, yeah. Sorry, Rahab. Rahab, Ahab, pretty close. Um, and so it goes on and just talks about a whole bunch of other people who testify about faith. David, Samson, all these people are all examples in the Old Testament of faith. And it actually says this in, in um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, now all these things happen to them, and them being those in the Old Testament, as examples of... And they were written for our instructions upon whom the ends of the earth have come. And so we can go back into the Old Testament. Yes, Derek, we can go back into the Old Testament. And we can glean and learn from those Israelites. We can do two things. We can learn what not to do. And we can learn what to do. And so when we see this chapter 11, we are seeing the things we're called to do. And it's a great study, church. It's a great study to look at this and you see the other names and stuff. It's a great study to study their life. Study the David of David's life. All that he went through and the faith that he continued to have. Now, even in his faith, he didn't have great days always. He had bad days. In that faith that was growing and being more and more solidified in God, he had bad days. He had people trying to kill him. He had armies trying to kill him. He had bad days. He had days where he would look and go, look at the rich. They prosper and look at me. And yet, he stayed faithful. And so if David could do it, why can't we? If David could do it, and if David is, is growing as a man of God and becoming more and more a man after God's heart, which was because of his faith, why can't we? Why can't you? Because you're better equipped today than he was. Come on, can I hear an amen? amen? And so we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Those that have gone before and those that will come after us. Can I, can I say this or can I ask this question today? Do you think it's possible that as God's still jour jour journaling in heaven and he has books he's journaling in, is it possible that there'll be people in this church where God will say, look at their faith? Now, we know he's not going to be writing another Bible, but when we get to heaven, come on, will he begin to declare before the audience of believers that will be hearing what's going on at the throne room of judgment, will they hear, Donna, you had such great faith. I wrote it all about it. I wrote about your faith that you had. Let me recite it to you. Come on, Ellie. Your name will be there. Betty, your name will be there. Sammy, your name. Hey! Don't forget back there, Casey. Come on. Come on. Our names can have in heaven written books about the faith that we've learned to have, that we've grown to have. And you've got to believe that that can be you too. Because if you don't believe it, then I'm going to tell you what will happen. You'll come to a place where you settle in your faith. And I will call it a lack of faith. Because faith is continuing to grow upon, is growing upon, growing upon, growing upon, growing upon. Because that's what God's doing. One area of your life may be easy to have faith. Another area is just difficult. And God's going to zero in on that. And he's going to bring that faith up to a new level. Because he's a good God. Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen? So it says this, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us. Isn't that awesome? So since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us. So let's let's look at this. Obviously, how many have worked out before? Okay? And if you haven't worked out, how many had babies that have lifted them up? You lifted up a weight right there. Okay? It's an, it's a, it's an alive weight, but it's a weight nonetheless. And so when we look at that weight, that weight is, a, a weight here is anything that serves to hinder or prevent somebody from doing something. Okay? It's, it's a hindrance. It's something that impedes us moving forward in faith. And so, so the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, we got this great cloud of witnesses, okay? Let's throw off every weight. Come on. Everything that hinders us from moving forward in faith, right? But watch this. 
The next thing is, is it's let's, let's throw off every weight and sin. Okay. Now I want to say this before I get to what I believe that sin is, because I believe it's very specific. If we will, if we'll read out scripture, right? I want to I want to say this first as a disclaimer to what I'm about ready to say. That I believe sin in your life that you continue to practice and you allow God to have victory in your life over there, I believe it's going to be a hindrance to your life and your walk of faith. Okay? But I believe when the writer put weights and sin in here, I believe that specific sin, because it didn't say sins, it said sin, I believe it was, I believe it was the sin of unbelief. Okay? So we're to throw off every weight or everything that hinders us in this sin of unbelief. And why do I say that? Because if you study out Hebrews, if you go through it, even if you look at what was written prior to this, he's, he's magnifying the faith of these people. You go further back in, 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 in Hebrews, you're going to understand that he also brings a charge against Israel itself as a whole. And they couldn't enter in when they came out of Egypt. It said they couldn't enter into the promised land because of the sin of unbelief. Are you following me now? So I believe when the writer is writing this, hey, we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Therefore, throw off everything that hinders you in the sin of unbelief because it ensnares you. Well, how does sin, how does the sin of unbelief ensnare us? So, you know, as, as I'm thinking about this, well, let me not, not go there there. This, I just want to read some scripture here. Hebrews 9.13 says, so we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. This is speaking of Israel coming out of Egypt. It says in Psalms 78, 22, they wrote about it in the Psalms, right? For they did not believe God or trust him to care for them. Well, sometimes we find ourselves in that place of unbelief where we don't trust that God cares for us and that he'll take care of us. But I want to tell you today, the only way you become to be solidified in that is to see him, come on, to see him care for you and take care of you. But it takes faith to believe that he will. See how that's a vicious cycle? If we don't have the faith to believe it, we won't see it. Even in His goodness, because without faith, it's impossible to even please God, right? That's what it says in Hebrews. Come on. And so, so we, we have this, these weights and these things become a snare to faith. And, and so, um, you know, here's the thing. A snare is something that exerts tight control over us. Think about that, a snare. How many, how many ladies know what a snare is? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to tell you what a snare is. And I'm going to do it by telling you an example. We have some friends of ours, the Bill Pogos, and they have a son named Devin, and he's kind of a, he's kind of a, uh, an outdoor kind of guy. He likes to do things. I remember when he was younger, he was telling me this story that he was trying to catch this lizard, right? Because he likes that kind of stuff. And so... He was struggling to catch this lizard. This lizard was pretty smart. But he figured, you know, he did some research, I think, and figured out, hey, if I created a snare, maybe I can get it. So what he did is he took this little rope, and he made a little, kind of like a slip knot on it. And then on the other side of it, he, he kind of got it up in such a way that the, the lizard could walk through it and put something to bait him, on, bait that lizard on the other side. And so when the lizard went to go get that, he went through the snare, and it triggered to yank it. And once it yanked it, it tightened around it, and it couldn't get out because it was a slipknot. Mm -hmm. That's what a snare is. Mm -hmm. Listen, unbelief is a snare to our faith. Yep. It entices us because we start looking at things more in the natural than we start looking at things from God's perspective. When we start focusing on the natural and putting more, more eye candy on the natural, then we begin to get caught up in that and we start going towards that. We start putting more energy and focus in what we're seeing. And as we're doing that, that unbelief is beginning to tighten down on us and it's beginning to control us. You understand? And the more we keep seeing in the natural, it starts tightening us down more and more, and it actually begins to control us. Where we're supposed to have faith, now we're in a place of being controlled by unbelief. And unbelief is a sinister ploy of the enemy to destroy you from the inside out. I was talking with somebody recently, um, 
just about some things in their life and and uh, um, you know some some meetings I like to have and other meetings you're like uh, I don't know because some sometimes you know sometimes a pastor has to say what people don't want want to hear right yeah. Yeah. and so this person was struggling with faith and I get that because who hasn't struggled with areas of faith mm -hmm. and so in the midst of conversation it comes out that they're making a comparison between their life and other people's lives mm -hmm. they're making a comparison between their life as a Christian and a life of a non-believer right and so it all came down to this, that the, that the non-believer had things they didn't have. Mm -hmm. And what it did was it brought an unthankful heart, which kept going on and on and on, which produced bitterness. <coughs> that destroys. Bitterness destroys faith. Yeah. And so I'm having to listen to this. And I, had, and I had to do this. I had to go back to basics, okay? Okay, so you're making a comparison between what a non-believer has and a believer doesn't have. Let me ask you a simple question. If that person, that non-believer, died with all those things, where would they end up? Well, they had to answer that question. Hell, right. Okay, you don't have that stuff. What would happen if you died right now? Would go to heaven. Okay. So are you saying right now that you would rather have those earthly things that are going to perish and go away anyways? Would you trade that for heaven and hell? Are you following me? Yeah. yeah. And so now I can tell agitation is starting to set in because it's kind of like you got caught. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like, like, like this. And then this comes out of their mouth. Well, you know, I used to. I used to have what they had. Right? Here, here's the thing. Were you saved when you had that? No. Okay. What if you died having that stuff? You were happy then. Where would you, where would you go if you died at that point where you didn't know God, but you had that same stuff? Well, I would go to hell. Okay. Is hell worth a few things that you don't have and heaven worth what you don't have? What, what's the value to things, right? What's the value to them if it means heaven or hell? Yeah. And now it's getting more quiet. And so I had to bring this whole conversation around back to just being unthankful. Not being thankful for what you do have. And of course, this is what bitterness does. Bitterness blinds. Unbelief blinds. You don't see what you have anymore. You see what you don't have. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm trying to bring this person's back to the perspective. Look what you have. And I'm starting to list things out that I know they have. And it's like there's a sense of rumbling inside. I can see it in this person of being really agitated because I'm coming back to the simplicity of the goodness of God. You have food on the table. You have shelter over you. You have, and I just went down through a whole list of things. I didn't say the things that they didn't have because I didn't want to bring any more attention to that. They have no problem noticing what they don't have. But sometimes we got to come back and look at what we do have, what God has given us. Yes. And be thankful right there yes. because in the end, I would rather be in heaven than in hell having earthly goods. Amen. So we don't want our life to be, we don't want unbelief in our life to become this snare that we just get so wrapped up in unbelief that we become disillusioned. That, and, and as that happens, it's just tightening down. It's choking us spiritually to death. That's what unbelief does. And the enemy loves, loves you and me to fall into unbelief. we got to guard against that. we got to acknowledge that, you know what? I'm falling. Things that I used to believe in, I don't believe anymore. we got to come back. we got to check that real quick. Okay? We gotta check that real quick and we gotta come back to some of the basics again of faith. Amen? Amen. So here's a, here's a scripture. Psalms 27. It says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord. And the reason I want to say that is because here, here's the thing. In this verse, what is the focus of some people? Their trust is in the natural. Come on. 
Chariots and horses are natural things. That's where the focus was, was on the natural. That's where they put their trust in. But as believers, we're not called to put our trust in the natural. We're called to put our name in the name of our trust in the name of the Lord. That's where our trust goes into. And we allow God to do the promotion. We allow God to do, hey, I'm going to bless you with this. Maybe you have to wait for something for a while, but maybe he'll bless you for it. Maybe he, you need to learn a little more in patience or, or endurance. Come on, we're talking about endurance, right? Maybe you need some endurance. So maybe there, maybe God's trying to teach you some endurance. Amen. So that's maybe why you don't have something right now. Amen? Amen. So we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and we're to throw off church. We're to throw off these ways, these things that, that hinder us in the, in the sin of unbelief. And we're to run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, I want to say this. There is a race that is set before you today. And it's a race of faith. And here's the thing. You don't get an A if you finish before everybody else. You don't get an A if you think your faith is better than anybody else. The truth of the matter, this is an individual race that you run alone. Not alone, alone, but alone. It's, there's no comparison to anybody to your right, your left, in front, or behind. There's no comparison. This is your race. We are all in this race together, but it is our race. We're not competing against one another. We are just hopefully surrendering to the Lord and allowing the Lord to have his work in our lives. Right? So it's not a race where, yeah, I'm ahead of you. I'm ahead of you. You're, you're, you're a loser. No, that's not this race. Because you'll stand before God as an individual, not the people you run against, not the people you run with. You'll stand as an individual to give an account for your faith, not their faith. They're not going to give an account for your faith. They're going to give an account for our faith, my faith, right? right. So we got to get this idea that I'm, this is a competition. It's not a competition. This is something God's doing in all of our lives. And God is calling all of us to get better in this race. But we have to run this race with endurance because it doesn't always come easy. Right. Matter of fact, as I look through the New Testament, I'm shocked by how many times Paul wrote in different letters that, He's shocked that people are shocked, that Christians are shocked that they're going through difficulty and persecution and, and being afflicted. He's like, you're called to this. Yep. Boy, that's the scripture we like in America, huh? <laughs> what you say, I'm called. I serve the most high God. I shouldn't have to go through anything difficult. That's not the Bible. That's false preaching, right? That's, that's let's tell people what they want to hear. Let's make them feel good. No, we're going to go through affliction. We're going to go through persecution. We're going to go through trial because that's what it, Jesus went through. Yep. He paid to set us free. He paid to take away the sin of death and, and, and the penalty of sin, right? But he didn't, he didn't die to then make us go, here, I'm going to give you the easiest road in the world. That's not Christianity. Read your Bible. Yep. Read it. If you hear some pastor saying, your life should be a walk of ease, turn the TV, shut off the, the radio, do something, just get as far away from it because they're setting you up for unbelief, in my opinion. Because they're telling you something that's not even biblical and you're going to buy it and then you're going to find yourself in hardship because God's not going to let that lie get away. He's going to bring some hardship in your way to say, hey, this is who I really am. I'm a good father, but I'm more interested in your faith growing, not being stagnant and dead. Oh boy. But we're to run with endurance. And we're to set aside everything that hinders that. Amen? Now, I said we were, were, we were running alone, and we are. But here's the cool thing we all have the same trainer. How many of you have seen marathons, right? Anybody see marathons? Anybody ran a marathon? I know there's one in here. But when you run a long marathon, they usually have a team that doesn't run with them. They have a team that is in strategic locations along the, the, the track. And they're there to get them water. Sometimes they're there to get them food. Um, you know, how many times have you seen tables where they're running by and, and the other people are trying to run to get them water? And that's their team trying to help them out, right? Amen. And these are like the professional ones. I'm not talking about the, you know, I'm just going to walk this thing because I did not. Uh, a 5K we did once upon a time, but we didn't run, we walked. Of course, I had an Aaliyah on my back the whole time, and boy, that was a treat. Um, talk about endurance, but that taxed the back out. Um, 
But they have people along the way. Well, we have Jesus, our trainer. Amen. He's running with us. And he's rooting us on saying, come on, you can do this. Come on, hang in there. You're going to get through this. Come on. He's an encourager. Come on. He, he's for us, not against us. He's not sitting there trying to trip us. He's not sitting there trying to put weights in front of us. He's trying to help us, right? And so we're running this race um, together. And, and sometimes in this race, we have difficulty. Anybody do anything in life and you found out that there was difficulty that came with it? Okay. We can all say yes to that. But there's things that we, we have to do. And, and God's rooting us on. But it says this in James 1.3. It says, for you know that when your faith is tested, here, we don't like this, but this is word, your endurance has a chance to grow. We're talking about endurance today. We're talking about a faith that endures. And a faith that endures, to, to, to get any endurance out of it, it's got to be tested. Okay? Now, it says, it, well, I won't go there. We don't like that, right? Because we want the easy walk. We don't want anything difficult. We want it easy. But that's not the way it works because you never know what you know until it's tested. Right, come on. That's the thing about a test, you guys. When you study out James, it's a test. A test is going to do two things. It's going to show you what you know. Yay. It's also going to show you what you don't know. And in the showing of what you don't know, now we have identification of I need to grow in that area. If you took a test in college, you would get some right, hopefully more, and some wrong. Well, when you got the wrong, you go, oh, I don't know that I need to go back and study this because this will probably be on the final exam, right? And so when, we, when our faith gets tested, it begins to show us where our faith really is. Is our faith in God or is our faith in our ability? Because come on, let's be honest. Our ability can accomplish some things, but it can't accomplish everything. And that's where a true test of faith gets beyond what we can do, and it gets where the focus is totally on God to be the one that's going to get us through and to grow and mature our faith in that area. If we never go through anything, we will never know what our faith is like. That's right. We can talk like it's really big. We can talk like it's the greatest faith in the world, but proof is in the pudding when you actually go through the test, and that's the Bible. God is growing our faith, and in it, he's going to test. He's going to allow testing to come our way. It says in, in James 5.11, we give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, everybody's favorite person in the Bible, Job. Well, look what it says, a man of great endurance. Everybody say, great endurance. Great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end, for the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. Come on, how many of you are familiar with that story of Job? Boy, nobody would want that story in your life. But that is an awesome illustration of a person who persevered and endured through the grievous of things that he had to go through to grow in faith. And I love how God brought him to the end. I love how God was, was tender in mercy in all of it. Even in his inability of, of knowing everything, God was still tender in him correcting him. Come on. We don't need the friends that are saying, oh yeah, this is all your fault because you did this and you didn't have enough faith in this and this and this. We don't need that. We need a God who's rooting us on as we're Amen. running this race of endurance to say, hey, you got this. Amen. Come on, I'm with you. I'm going to grow you in this area. We don't need the naysayers of blaming everything on you. And yes, we can make dumb choices and we've all made them, but in the end, God can not erase necessarily the penalty, but he can erase sometimes the heartache of those things and grow us and mature us in those areas. Are you with me? Amen. And so Job is even a great um, uh, example of faith in the Old Testament. So let me ask you this. How do you build endurance? So let's, let's look at this. Let's look at this in a natural sense, okay? Um, I'm doing my best to try to get in shape. Better shape. I shouldn't say get in. Let's just get in better. Let's start there. Let's just get in better shape. Yeah. All right, we'll start there, and then maybe we'll progress from there. And so I, I'm in the gym, I'm lifting weights, um, and then I'm doing cardio, um, shooting for six days a week, right? And so um, how many like cardio here? Anybody like cardio? Yeah. Yeah. You're probably not doing cardio right if you like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Because um, here's the thing. To build cardio, you have to press yourself beyond what you're used to, right? Let me give you an example. I like doing the elliptical, and the reason I like doing the elliptical is because my feet aren't actually hitting anything. I'm all up in the air and I'm doing this. Yeah, baby, this is awesome. You know, this is cool. No impact on my hips, no impact on my jaw, no impact on anything. I'm just going on. It's like the only, well, when you're big and you're running on hard pavement, everything. <laughs> it's ugly. That's why I don't, that's why I don't like running. Um, a treadmill I can do, but I've ran on those before and I've broken them. Um, which my wife thought I was having a heart attack. Um, because she was downstairs, I'm running. And it snapped. I snapped the welds on it. And it just went <clears throat> And of course, I came off the back end and I landed it, right? And so by the time she got up there, I'm on the ground. I'm trying to look underneath it. But I'm laying down. She's thinking, my hubby died. <laughs> but I wasn't. I was fine. So I'm, I'm on the elliptical. And the elliptical has two settings on it. It has uh, elevation, uh, a rise, or whatever they call it, and then it has tension. So you can start out flat, we're at zero, zero. Now, if I got on the elliptical and I did zero, zero, I could go 250 strides a, 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 a minute, and I wouldn't even break a sweat. Because there's no rise to it, there's no tension to it. So. I have to rise it up, and so here's the way elliptical works if you don't. The higher you go, the more it works different muscles from your waist down. So the higher you go, it actually works your glutes. Okay, how many know what your glutes are? I'll tell you, your butt muscles. Okay, when you have a flat butt like I do, you need some butt muscles. You need to get some bubble to that flatness, right? So, oh yes I did. And so, <laughs> and so you raise it, you lower it, whatever. And so, for me, sometimes I, I do things that I shouldn't do, but I always push myself, right? Which isn't good when you're getting back into things, you kind of push yourself. So, my aim when I'm working on my cardio is, I need to be sucking wind. Yeah. <laughs> because when I'm sucking wind, I'm taxing my body to go further than what it's ever gone before. Mm -hmm. And so now listen, I watch my heart rate while I'm doing that because as you're holding on it, let you know what your heart rate is. I hope it's right. I hope it's, you know, give or take a few, but hopefully not give or take 25 because that was the case I could be over 200 at times on the heartbeat per minute. But so I tax myself by forcing my body to go higher, more, more tension, and longer, right? And so as I do that, I'm now sucking more wind, I'm expanding my lungs, I'm training them to do more. I'm, I'm forcing them to endure punishment. Yeah. And then I'll come back down, slowly start coming back down. And then if, if your cardio is getting better, your, your body will recover faster, right? And so you're not <laughs> for the next 20 minutes, right? So as you're coming back down, because I'll go up, like on the elliptical, it goes up to 20 and 20. So I'll go to 1917 as, as, as my max right now, and I'll do that for like two minutes. But I'm all the way going up, I'm climbing in the increments of two on both, okay? And so as I'm doing that, I'm training my body to breathe harder. And then I start working my way down slowly, like I work my way up. And as I'm working down, my heart's not beating as fast anymore. It's recovering fairly well. It doesn't get back down to like 100 when I started because, I've, because I'm, I'm not quitting. So you go back down and then I'm going back up to the top again and I'm taxing my lungs again, I'm breathing harder, I'm teaching myself to endure longer periods of time of doing this and therefore my cardio gets better, right? So now when I'm out playing softball, I'm not winded when I get to first base, which is what, 65 feet from home? <laughs> and if the guys are forcing me to do a double, I'm not like crawling in the second and God forbid they say, go three, go three! I'm not like calling for oxygen when I when I fall over and I get there, right? Now I should be able to, as long as I keep this up, I should be able to play softball this next softball season and be able to get around the bases a lot easier, recover a lot faster, because I have grand bases and I'm still breathing hard when I gotta go catch, right? I'm still going, wow. Woo! Wow, too bad I got thrown out <laughs> at first. No. <laughs> 
But this is the same with faith. We're to run this race of faith with endurance. And to do it is it has to be pushed. Come on. It has to be pushed to grow. It has to be challenged to grow. If it's never pushed and never challenged, you don't get cardio in your faith. It becomes that wimpy faith like I had this last softball season and probably 10 before that, where you're like, whoa, gosh, that's bad. Amen? But here's the thing. We're to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus is our focus. Okay? It's not the finish line. The focus is Jesus, because Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. If our faith is somewhere else, we're going to fail. It's got to be on Jesus. And hear why it has to be on Jesus. Um, Jesus is the author. He's the initiator of our faith. Okay? We know the scripture in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Everybody has a measure of faith, church. God gives everybody. He initiates contact with faith. Right? Follow me? And so we have it. He's given to us. It's a gift. Everybody has this gift. Everybody has the ability to believe. It might be a mustard seed, but we all have it. A lot of people reject it. A lot of people walk by sight, right? And not by faith. But we all have it. And so Jesus is the initiator of our faith. He is also our example of faith, church. He walked it. He lived it. He grew in it. He was challenged in it. In the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's asking, Lord, if this cup could pass by me, if there was another way, I'll take that way. But he knew he was going to the cross. And if you understood like he did the cross, it was not a great place to go. It was a place of testing. This garden was a place of testing. Jesus went through all of this. Jesus is the one that we look to because he's a perfect example of walking faith out. He's a perfect example of seeing difficulty come and working through that difficulty. And so we keep our eyes focused on him, the author of our faith, faith our, the initiator of our faith, the finisher of our faith. He wants our faith to grow. He wants us to cross the finish line. He doesn't want us to give up. He doesn't want us to go, okay, I've had enough. My cardio's done. I can't handle this anymore. Remember, Scripture says God will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. Come on. He will never allow you to be tempted beyond your... So don't give up because it's hard. Keep fighting through because if he gave it to you, he believes you can get through it because he's leading the way. But too many times we vacate. We go, I give up. I tap out. I do whatever. But God is calling us because he's with us and he's rooting us on. Press on. Endure. I'm trying to make something out of you. I'm trying to bring you to another level. I'm trying to get you to have some cardio in your life of faith that you're going to press on. And when the going gets tough, you're going to go, I'm going to press on more because God's with me. And I'm victorious in Christ Jesus. <sighs> okay. No, I'm actually kind of good. It says this in James 1 and 2. We already did 3, but I want you to hear James 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but that word is also translated endurance. Come on. Count it all joy. Nope, don't want to do that. No, that's what Scripture says. Count it all joy when you face various trials. Various means many different types of trials. Count it all joy. Why? Because God's with you. Why? Because he's, he's victorious. And because he's victorious, we are more than conquerors. Come on. God's called us to endure. And it says this about Jesus in this verse. Who, for the joy that was set before him, him being Jesus, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the Father, right hand, hand of, of the throne of God. Isn't that awesome? He is our example, church. And if we need some help, we know who to go to. So let me give you quickly, quickly, eight things. And I'm not going to talk about them. I'm just going to give you eight things. Some things that can help us with this process. Number one, we need to get to know God better. Because your faith is always going to challenge who God is. And if you don't know who God is, your faith will always be on the rocks. Okay? Number two, get to know him through his word. His word he's given us, it reveals who he is. It reveals his character. It reveals everything you need to know about him. It's in his word. Uh, number three, study the gospel and build our faith into what Jesus did. 
Because it says greater things we will do because he goes to the Father. And he did some pretty awesome things, church. Um, number four, be thankful in everything. Even the difficult things. Be thankful in them because that is the will of God. Give thanks in all things. Understand trials are a way of maturing us in trusting God. Number five, remember the past doings of God in your life. Those will always be milestones for you to come back to go. When you're in a difficult time, when, when you're, when you're cardioed out, to be able to remember back what God has done for you previously. Believe he's going to, number six, believe he's going to do even greater things in us and through us. Where we are today is only part of the race. What God wants to do ahead is so much greater than what we've already experienced. Number, uh, number seven, <clears throat> be, in, be a source of encouragement towards other people. As we're all in the same race together, be a source of encouragement, not a Debbie Downer. And what I mean by that is encourage them as they're growing in their faith. Don't tear them down. Don't be the, well, I don't, I don't think you're going to be able to get this one. No, encourage them because it's exactly what Jesus is doing for you. Encourage, and God will use us to, to encourage others to grow in faith. Uh, we can't be scolding people because we think their faith isn't faith enough, right? That's God's job to do. You don't see the disciples running around saying, Peter, you didn't have enough faith. No, Jesus did that. When he said to his disciples, where's your faith? Right? It's not our job to say that. Our job is to encourage in faith and to be a part of the process of building faith. Number eight, keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ. All right, let's stand. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, I just simply pray a simple prayer, Lord, and that would be that you would help us mature in our faith. No matter where we're at today, that, Father, it would go to a new level, that we can look back in the months ahead and go, hey, thank you, Jesus, for bringing me here. Thank you for maturing me in my faith. Lord, we need your grace to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.